Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Eric Tate, and I am uh, one, of, one of the co-chairs of this committee on utilizing advanced environmental health and geospatial data and technologies to inform community investment. I'm a professor of geography at the University of Iowa, and um, I focus on indicators of social vulnerability to hazards. My co-chair is Harvey Miller. Um, Harvey, um, can you introduce yourself and, and uh, maybe your affiliation and your main area of expertise? And we'll follow that with um, the committee can uh, do the same. Uh, sure thing. I'm Harvey Miller. I'm a professor of geography and director of the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis at The Ohio State University. And my areas are geospatial science, transportation, and sustainability. Um, let's go with Monica. Hi, um, sorry, I'm having, I have some hearing loss and I can't see the caption, so I'm a little delayed on trying to hear you all. Um, so are we just doing introductions? Yes, brief introduction. Okay. Um, Monica Unseld, um, of Until Justice Data Partners, we do environmental justice research and we partner with communities to do their own research in Louisville, Kentucky. Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren Bennett. Um, I'm a program manager for spatial analysis and data science at ESRI and focus on spatial statistics and spatiotemporal analysis. Walker. Hello, I'm Walker Wieland. I'm a research scientist with the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, part of the California Environmental Protection Agencies, and I develop environmental health screening tools. Kathleen. Hi, I'm Kathy Segerson. I'm in the Department of Economics. I'm a professor there at the University of Connecticut, and my field is environmental economics and environmental policy. <clears throat> Ibrahim. Hi, everyone. I'm Ibrahim Karai. I'm an assistant professor of population health at Hofstra University. Um, I study the physical and mental health impacts of injuries and disasters on socially vulnerable populations. Marcos. Hi everyone, Marcos Luna. I'm a professor of geography and sustainability at Salem State University in Salem, Massachusetts. And I'm also the coordinator of the Geoinformation Science Graduate Program there. And I work with communities using geospatial and other techniques to address environmental justice needs. And Jay. Hi, uh, I'm a professor of geography in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Texas, El Paso, uh, interested in applying geospatial tools and variety of quantitative methods for analyzing environmental and social injustices. Also serving as a member of the US EPA Science Advisory Board and the new EPA Environmental Justice Science Committee and chairing the EPA's EGS Screen Scientific Review Panel. Okay, I think I got everybody on the committee. Um, we also have um, staff members from the National Academies that are helping to coordinate this meeting. Uh, this includes Samantha Maxino, Anthony DePinto, and now Shane Orr. Uh, Amir Robinson is helping uh, produce this webinar. So I'm gonna give you a brief roadmap of where we're headed today in this session. We're going to have presentations from two um, groups in the federal government. We're here, we'll hear from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, talking about their tools um, for looking at uh, burdens and uh, disadvantage. Uh, afterwards, the, we'll have some time for the committee to ask clarifying questions uh, of each presentation. At 2 p.m. Eastern, we're going to have a 20-minute break, and we'll return uh, for a panel discussion between the presenters from the CDC and EPA and CEQ and the committee. Uh, throughout this process, people can submit written comments through the Alchemer um, that will provide a link in the chat. And as always, written comments are welcome through the the study website, and we'll put that link in there as well. 
Just a disclaimer that I should read out that uh, any conclusions or recommendations made by individuals during this event should be considered opinions of those individuals and should not be considered conclusions, or recommendations issued by this committee or the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. All right, so that sort of concludes the intro. <laughs> um, I'd like to welcome um, Ben, McK ben McKenzie. He's a geospatial epidemiologist and coordinator of the Environmental Justice Index at the CDC, an agency for toxic substances and disease registry. Uh, ben, uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Eric, and thanks for that introduction. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen, and I'll start off by uh, sharing a little bit more about the Environmental Justice Index. Can someone confirm that they can see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so again, I'm Ben McKenzie, a geospatial epidemiologist with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. I identify as a white man. My pronouns are he, him, his, and for descriptive purposes, um, I'm wearing a blue dress shirt and a black jacket, joining through Zoom with a, a blue CDC ATSDR background behind me. So I'll be presenting to you all today on the Environmental Justice Index. So CDC and ATSDR, in association with the US Department of Health and Human Services Office of Environmental Justice, developed the Environmental Justice Index, or EJI, as a tool to help to address the uh, environmental injustice and health disparities linked to injustice by measuring and visualizing where US communities are facing the cumulative impacts of environmental burden on their health and well being. So, for the purposes of our tool, we define cumulative impacts as the total harm to human health that occurs from the combination of environmental burden, pre existing health conditions, and social factors. So, this EJI was publicly released uh, on August 10th, 2022, uh, with the launch of a website at eji.cdc.gov, as well as a publicly available mapping tool called the Environmental Justice Index Explorer which allows users to interact with EJI maps and data. And I'll, I'll show a little bit more about that uh, later in this presentation. I want to emphasize that what the EJI does is provide a single score that distills data on environmental, social, and health factors into an understandable measure, a measure that can be used for context and comparison when thinking about how to address injustice and promote health. And health is front and center in how we develop the EJI uh, and in how we see it being applied. I also want to make sure to mention uh, that the EJI measures these cumulative impacts at the community level, visualizing the relative impacts of injustice on health for census tracts across the United States. And over here on the right, uh, you can kind of see what that looks like for DeKalb County, Georgia, which is where I live and work. So this map taken from our EJI Explorer shows what level of relative cumulative impacts on health might be facing communities in my county. Tracts and darker shades of those with high relative EJI rankings represent communities that might experience more severe impacts on health relative to the rest of the country. This EJI is the first national place-based tool that's designed specifically for the purpose of measuring cumulative impacts of environmental burden on health doing this, as we say, through the lenses of human health and health equity. But I also want to emphasize that the EJI wasn't developed in a vacuum. It really builds on existing tools like the CDC ATSDR Social Vulnerability Index, as well as state-level environmental justice screening tools like California's CalEnviro screen tool. The EJI is adapted from the environmental justice screening method, um, a method that's been used by governments, uh, scholars, and community groups to produce cumulative impacts screening tools that combine the best geospatial data available for their jurisdictions. And broadly speaking, this environmental justice screening method combines data representing environmental, social, and health factors that contribute to overall impacts on health. So the first uh, EJSM or environmental justice screening method tool officially adopted by a state government uh, was CalEnviro Screen, uh, which was first launched in 2013, a tool I know many on the committee are very familiar with. CalEnviro Screen provides a composite spatial index that combines 21 indicators, 
or individual measurable factors that contribute to cumulative impacts. Cal Virus Screen uses indicators that represent both aspects of cumulative pollution burden and indicators that represent aspects of population characteristics, uh, characteristics that make people more vulnerable to the health effects of pollution. And this method of combining environmental, social, and health factors together to highlight cumulative impacts has been really popular among environmental justice scholars and advocates. Uh, I know many on the committee will have read some of the excellent calls to action by environmental justice scholars like Charles Lee and organizations like UCLA's Luskin Center for Innovation. Calls to action which really emphasize the importance of taking a holistic view in thinking about injustice and health. And the popularity and usefulness of this environmental justice screening method have led state after state to develop their own tools following California's example. States like Washington, Colorado, uh, and Michigan and more have developed their own environmental justice mapping and screening tools that measure cumulative impacts, each using a mix of state-specific uh, state specific and national data sets. So with this precedent in mind, we set out to create a national level composite spatial index to measure cumulative impacts by adapting the environmental justice screening method. We began by developing a theoretical framework for our tool, using the environmental justice screening method as our basis, uh, and with a focus on creating a tool that measures cumulative impacts on health and well being. We decided early on that the framework of our index, its, it's building blocks, if you will, would be health vulnerability, environmental burden, and social vulnerability. And each of these three components, uh, which we call modules, are designed to be composite indices in and of themselves. In fact, uh, both the social vulnerability and environmental burden modules of the EJI are themselves adapted from other indices produced by uh, CDC ATSDR, namely the social vulnerability index and the environmental burden index. This means that each module within the EJI represents a distinct measurable concept that contributes to those overall cumulative impacts on health. So like Cal Screen, we used a percentile ranking method to normalize and to aggregate our data at the census tract level, meaning that indicator scores uh, within the EJI are represented along a zero to one scale with a uh, score of 0 0.85 for a given census tract uh, for a given indicator, meaning that that tract in question ranks higher for that indicator than 85% of all other census tracts in the nation. And this percentile ranking method is relatively simple and effective and makes the tool easy to communicate and to adapt to local needs, uh, something that we felt was really important for our tool, uh, knowing that in injustice occurs locally. Like most environmental justice screening method tools, uh, we chose not to assign any weights to individual indicators within these modules, um, which actually differs a bit from Cal Screen which does assign higher scores to environmental indicators that represent uh, measures of exposure to pollution uh, than to indicators that represent other aspects of environmental burden, which Cal Screen refers to as environmental effects. The Cal Screen documentation really emphasizes that these environmental effects are given half the weight of pollution exposures because the presence of pollution due to hazardous sites or land uses doesn't necessarily translate to actual exposure to pollution, which is what Cal Screen measures. We, we made the decision to weight environmental effects equally to factors like air pollution, because we felt it was important to acknowledge and to account for uh, the effects not only of potential chemical contamination associated with, with some sites, um, but also the effects on community stress and well-being of non-chemical stressors. Uh, stressors like noise pollution, odor pollution, and other forms of environmental degradation or lack of environmental amenities. I'll also mention something kind of unique in the way that uh, EJI's health vulnerability module is calculated. So while state-level cumulative impacts tools use state-level data on things like hospitalizations due to asthma or heart disease, those kinds of data aren't available consistently at the national level. What we do have instead at the national level are estimates of chronic disease prevalence at the census tract level, 
provided through CDC's PLACES program in the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. So these PLACES data use, uh, or these PLACES estimates use data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, uh, as well as some demographic data in order to model small area estimates of disease prevalence. Estimates which really are the gold standard for granular disease prevalence data at the national level. However, some of the demographic data used to create these estimates are also used in our social vulnerability module, uh, meaning that incorporating those estimates directly into the index could lead to potential overweighting of these factors uh, and issues of statistical dependence. So our team worked with the PLACES team at CDC to develop a method for incorporating those estimates into our index in a way that preserved some of the statistical dependence or independence between factors, ultimately uh, settling on a system where census tracts were flagged uh, if they scored in the top one third in the nation for a disease prevalence indicator, and then multiplying the sum of flags by a normalizing factor of 0 0.2 in order to create a final tract level score of between zero and one that could be directly compared and added to other module scores. And that brings me to the final step in calculating the EJI, where scores for all three modules, um, scores that range from zero to one for each, were summed and then percentile ranked again to calculate a final overall EJI ranking that represents relative cumulative impacts on health due to environment and vulnerability. This again differs a bit from the widely used and Viroscree method, uh, which uses a multiplicative rather than an additive model. It's a bit more in line actually with methods used by that original environmental justice screening method. So, so I know that there's been a fair amount of work done comparing additive and multiplicative models, um, work that suggests a high degree of overlap in scores using these two methods. Um, but the uh, it's also been noted that the additive method does tend to allow more influence by individual modules. Um, just something to, to, to note about this method. Th that said, this additive method is intended to make the EJI both more adaptable uh, by users at the local level and to make it really easy to understand among a range of users with widely varying backgrounds and expertise. So having introduced kind of the framework and methods that we use to combine indicators within modules and then uh, ultimately to calculate uh, the overall index score, I'll go ahead and speak a little bit more to how we identified and evaluated indicators for inclusion in these modules in the overall index. So we initially identified a list of potential indicators uh, through a list uh, or through a mix of literature review, um, review of other tools like Cal Enviro Screen and EPA's EJ Screen, as well as consultation with subject matter experts. We screened these indicators for inclusion in the EJI using some overall criteria that we applied to the best national level data available for each indicator. So our first criterion was that all data had to be accurate and reliable, uh, meaning that we had to provide that we had to find data from a trusted source, such as a government agency, that could be relied upon to produce accurate data and to continue producing data in the future. Data also had to be analytically sound meaning that they had to be a quality measure of the indicator they are intended to represent. They had to be uh, available at scale. And because our unit of analysis was the U.S. Census Tract, that meant that all data, we required all data to be provided either at the Census Tract level or at some finer level of resolution that could be aggregated to Census Tract. And then finally, we required all data to be timely, uh, meaning that they had to represent relatively recent conditions uh, most of the data that we used were collected in the last five years, and these data had to be updated regularly so that we could use them in future updates to our index. This, uh, this kind of screening process resulted in a total of 36 indicators among all three modules. So I'll go ahead and show you what those look like for those individual modules. The EJI Environmental Burden Module includes 17 indicators each representing a feature of the environment whose presence or absence contributes to overall environmental burden on health. And these indicators are separated into five functional groups, uh, groups that we call domains, which represent aspects of air pollution, proximity to potentially hazardous and toxic sites, 
uh, features of the built environment, both positive and negative, um, pr proximity to noisy and polluting transportation infrastructure, and water pollution. All of these factors contribute in some way to community health and well being. And we know that many of them build on each other, amplifying overall effects on health, which is one reason why it's so critical to measure these factors cumulatively when thinking about impacts on health. It's also important to note here that this environmental burden module doesn't capture all environmental, all environmental issues. Um, data for some potential indicators that we initially identified, uh, indicators like indoor air pollution, uh, septic system failure, and associated soil contamination. Those data just aren't available as national data sets. Other data representing drinking water quality or agricultural pesticide use, uh, things that we really hope to measure, aren't available in a tool in a form that we can use for this kind of spatial tool at the resolution that we want to. It's also important to note that data on ozone, uh, fine particulate matter, and impaired surface waters aren't available for states like Alaska or Hawaii, which actually led to the exclusion of those states from the 22, 2022 version uh, of our index. These are all data limitations that we recognize and which we really hope to address in future versions of our tool um, as spatial environmental data improve and become more accessible. The second module of our index, the uh, social vulnerability module, includes 14 indicators uh, sorted into four domains representing aspects of racial and ethnic minority status, socioeconomic status, household characteristics, and housing type, which is a structure very similar to that of the uh, CDC ATSDR social vulnerability index for anyone who's familiar with that tool. These are all factors that, uh, that are known to modify or to compound the effects of environmental burden on health. And these also represent aspects of procedural justice, the ability of communities to influence environmental decision making. And then finally, the third module of the EJI is the health vulnerability module, which includes five indicators representing prevalence of key chronic conditions associated with environmental injustice and health equity, asthma, cancer, high blood pressure, diabetes, and poor mental health. And we know that people with these pre-existing conditions are more susceptible to the effects of environmental burden on their health. Environmental factors like air pollution, noise pollution, and aspects of the built environment have all been shown to exacerbate disease in people with these health conditions. So this health vulnerability just compounds those issues of environmental burden and social vulnerability to drive overall cumulative impacts on health. I wanna make sure to mention that one reason this module is relatively small compared to other modules is that prevalence for many chronic diseases are highly correlated. Uh, for example, high blood pressure is highly correlated with coronary heart disease, uh, partially at least because it's a precursor to that disease. So where indicators exhibited multicollinearity, we chose uh, between those indicators based on the strength of evidence linking that indicator with vulnerability to environmental effects on health. So with all that information in mind, and I know it's a lot, I wanted to make sure to mention that we provide this information and more on our website at eji.cdc.gov, uh, which has information like a short fact sheet, FAQs, and really detailed technical documentation that provides theory and basis for the EJI. Uh, everything from the rationale for why each indicator was included in our index and how it contributes to overall cumulative impacts on health, uh, to calculations running through how EJI scores were calculated, uh, specifically using example census tracts. And then finally, also mentioning uh, important limitations that should be considered when applying the EJI. You can also navigate from this page to our EJI Explorer, which I mentioned before. And I don't think I have time for a demo today, uh, at least right now. So I'll go ahead and, and for the interest of time, just mention that the EJI Explorer allows users to view patterns in relative cumulative impacts on health, to make comparisons using index scores, uh, and to find census tract level information on the individual factors contributing to cumulative impacts for each community. EJI data is also available through CDC's National Environmental Public Health Tracking Program uh, through their Environmental Justice Dashboard, where it can be viewed alongside a wealth of other national data related to environmental justice and health. 
I also want to make sure to acknowledge that community engagement is a key part of environmental justice, right? It's procedural justice, which is why since the release of the EJI, we've been working to host live demos, webinars, uh, and to participate in listening sessions in order to, to introduce communities, uh, public health partners, and subject matter experts to the EJI, and to get feedback that we can use to improve our tool going forward, uh, making it as representative as possible of the lived experiences of those uh, of people facing injustice and injustice's impacts on health. And then finally, I want to end by addressing one of our primary charges from this committee, our purpose in building this tool. Our primary purpose in developing the EJI has been to advance CDC and HHS goals of environmental justice and health equity. And we see the EJI as contributing to these goals by empowering communities, public health professionals, uh, and others to identify U.S. communities that experience the most severe cumulative impacts of injustice on health, uh, helping, helping those people to focus actions on areas with the greatest need, uh, helping to shape public health interventions that are aimed at alleviating health inequities, uh, guiding hypothesis development by people researching issues of environmental justice and health equity, and then finally allowing uh, policymakers and public health practitioners to establish meaningful goals for advancing health equity, uh, to track progress and evaluate success in moving towards a clean, cleaner, healthier, and more equitable future. So with that, I just wanna thank everyone for your time and I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions if we, if we have some time for that. Well, we just heard from Ben McKenzie, the CDC, talking about the Environmental Justice Index. And I just want to take a little bit of time to see if there are any clarifying questions uh, from the committee. Ibrahim. Thank you, uh, Benjamin, for the highly informing uh, presentation. So I have a couple of questions um, regarding the mental health components of the uh, of the index. Um, could you inform us about the the primary data source that you used for the for the mental health data specifically the mental health variables? Number one, the the variables included that were aggregated into the mental health uh, component, and then secondly the data sources use. Yeah, absolutely. So I, th I think you might be referring to the uh, indicator for estimated prevalence of poor mental health uh, within the health vulnerability module. So that again is drawing on CDC's places data. Uh, so those uh, small small area estimates uh, that, that, that are modeled using behavioral risk factor surveillance system data. Um, so it's specifically estimated prevalence of poor mental health uh, for greater than 14 days uh, with people, uh, with adults 18 and older in the United States. Um, so that's the, that's the data source that we're using for that indicator. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, ben, Benjamin. Um, I also have another question um, regarding the, the spatial unit of analysis. Um, I, I understand that um, the data were collected at the census tract level, but when I went in, into the website, I realized that um, one could actually download the data either at the census track, track level or the county level, the state level, for example. So um, could you please um, explain the justification for, um, for you making this data available at the county level? Um, that is one. And then secondly, um, was it um, too much of, um, was it challenging kind of like um, incorporating the county level? I can understand that you have the, data at the census tract level. So considering a higher a higher level would be much easier kind of aggregating, right? So um, I'm just wondering if there are challenges associated with that as well. So, so, so just to clarify, we actually, uh, the, the tool allows you to download data for, for a particular state or for a particular county, but all of the data are at the census tract level. Um, we currently don't calculate the EJI at the county level or any other kind of higher level of aggregation. Um, and, and, and we also kind of discourage people from aggregating EJI data up to those levels. So, um, well, again, while it's available through download for particular areas, um, we, we only provide the calculations at the census tract level. 
Thank you for the for the clarification, Benjamin. And not to um, digress too much, um, does the same apply to the um, SVI data as well? Because with that, I also know one could download at the county level with a, with a specific county level FPIS codes, right? That, uh, that's correct. Yeah, the, the SVI does provide calculations at both census tract and county levels. Um, but uh, again, kind of we're using both social vulnerability data, both that data from the census and, uh, you know, a, a variety of, of health and environmental data um, that, that aren't necessarily coming from that uh, or available also at the county level. Um, so, so we provide our calculations uh, purely at the census tract level. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely. Okay, Marcos. Um, thank you, Ben. That was a great presentation. Um, I I don't know if I misheard you. When you were talking about the health vulnerability uh, indicators that you use, you you commented that they were often correlated, um, and you tried to address that correlation between the variables um, by linking them to specific environmental burdens for that place. Did I hear that correctly, or could you explain how you handled that? Yeah, absolutely. No, so, so um, we when we found uh, when we found indicators that kind of satisfied our theoretical criteria for inclusion, you know, indicators that we had data for, um, and which also kind of uh, there was evidence in the literature that those indicators made populations more vulnerable to the effects of environmental burden on health, um, but they were highly correlated. We kind of just we we, we chose to go with the indicators. Where, where we saw uh, kind of more uh, a stronger evidence in the literature for how that indicator uh, uh, influenced uh, uh, or, or was made, made populations more vulnerable to health. So for example, looking between diabetes and uh, obesity, um, you know, there's a, a wealth of literature available on linkages between diabetes and vulnerability to environmental burdens. So that, that kind of influenced our decision to go with diabetes uh, as opposed to obesity. It is so that that's across the board. Then, when you're talking about this, or in individual, or like environmental burden specific cases. So, sorry, can you clarify your, the the question? So um, when you, so yeah, I'm sorry. When you're so when you're making that determination that you're kind of weighing which burden is most relevant or most influential or rel to that a, a given environmental burden, is that like a blanket decision for? across the country for that burden relative to that burden to that kind of health uh, vulnerability or are you making that decision sort of on a regional I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around how you're deciding when to choose one health vulnerability indicator as being relevant given a, an environmental burden yeah absolutely so um so we we uh, first off there 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 wasn't necessarily too many um, variables that ended up being excluded because of uh, because of kind of correlations right uh, there's not necessarily all that much data available at the national level um, you know with the census tract resolution um, so uh, for again kind of using the example of diabetes and obesity um, we we kind of looked at weighed the literature uh, showing uh, how obesity uh, it, how obesity made populations more vulnerable to health effects of environmental burden and the amount of literature uh, looking at diabetes and just kind of had to make a judgment call as to which one uh, which one had the most evidence behind it. Um, also con consulting with some subject matter experts, looking at other tools, uh, tools like the tool being developed in New York that kind of uh, also made the decision to go with diabetes. Um, so all of those kinds of factors were being taken into account in making those decisions. So we're running a little bit behind schedule. Lauren and Walker, do you mind holding on to your questions? We'll have a little bit more time for discussion after the break. So we definitely want to hear your, your questions. So, um, But I'd like to move to our next speakers. Um, we are going to hear from Tai Lung and Matthew Lee from the EPA. They're environmental protection specialists and their um, work on their, their tool EJ Screen. Um, Ty, Matthew, welcome. Thanks, Eric. But let me just make sure. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Actually, Ty's going to join us for the Q&A portion. 
Um, so I'm going to give you all a quick 20 minute uh, overview of EJ screen. And then, like I said, Ty will join us uh, afterwards. Um, but I really let me get this in presentation mode. Really appreciate the opportunity to to be here. Um, again, I'm Matthew Lee. I work in EPA's Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. Um, I also serve as a lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania, where I teach a course on the principles of mapping uh, for environmental justice. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing EPA's EJ screen to y'all today. Um, I'm going to, to kind of try to bring everybody on a level playing field with my, my 20 minute overview of, of EJ screen. Um, so some of you who are all familiar with the tool, this is gonna be uh, a little bit of a, of a regurgitation of information. But again, I think it's especially important for the Q&A portion to have everybody on a level playing field. Um, so I'm just gonna go over EJ screen um, generally, and then we can get into some, some details. Um, but EJ Screen is EPA's web-based GIS tool for nationally consistent EJ screening and mapping. And the keywords there are nationally consistent. We have coverage for the entire United States, including Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and we actually added just added data on the other U.S. Uh, territories into our tool. Um, but this is truly a nationally consistent EJ screening and mapping tool. And what EJ Screen does is that EJ Screen um, combines environmental and socioeconomic data to highlight areas where vulnerable populations may be disproportionately impacted by pollution. And hopefully, you know, as all of you on the call know, this gets at the crux of environmental justice, right? Your vulnerable populations, your poor, communities of color, linguistically isolated populations, communities on tribal lands who we know face higher pollution burdens. And those are the exact type of areas that a tool like EJ Screen strives to highlight. Now, equally important to understanding what EJ Screen is, is understanding what EJ Screen is not, right? This is a screening tool. All of these tools that we are talking about are screening tools. And for EJ Screen, we even put screen in the name. Again, this is a screening tool. It's not covering every single environmental uh, or EJ issue. And that national consistency that I just talked about, that is a limitation in and of itself because we are limited to the data sets for which there is national coverage. And EJ Screen is using the uh, census block group as a unit of analysis. And as I'll talk about in a second, that is a very refined unit uh, for which we simply don't have national wide data sets. Um, so again, this is a screening tool. I'm not gonna spend a ton more time here because most of these caveats and limitations are inherent of any screening tool, not just EJ Screen. But if you do come away with nothing else from my presentation, please recognize that EJ Screen is not a labeling tool. EJ Screen is not a designation tool, right? So you are not going to see maps from EJ Screen that says this is an EJ community or and this is not an EJ community. Uh, and that is an inherent difference between a tool like EJ Screen and CGIST, the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, which I know you all heard about a, a couple of weeks ago or earlier this week. Um, that is a designation tool, right? That does designate disadvantaged communities and not disadvantaged communities. That is not what EJ Screen is doing. EJ Screen is simply highlighting areas that have both vulnerable populations facing higher pollution burdens. And we primarily do that through the creation of two sets of indices. We have our primary EJ indices, and then we also have our newly created supplemental indices. And as the graphic on the right kind of alludes to, these indices are again, that combination of demographic data with an environmental indicator. Because we have 12 different environmental indicators built into the tool, we have 12 different EJ indices and 12 different supplemental indices. One index for each of the environmental indicators. And I'll go into the, the details of the calculation in a second. We also feature seven different socioeconomic indicators of, on their own. 
and we round out the tool with a suite of health, climate, and critical service gap indicators, all of which I'll go into detail in a second. EJ Screen is by no means a static tool. We update the tool on an annual basis, and even last year, 2022, we updated the tool twice. Um, so for our updates, any of the environmental data sets that can be updated are updated. Likewise, we are if, if the census releases newly available uh, census data, we are incorporating that into EJ Screen. EJ Screen is incorporating the Census Bureau's American Community Survey five-year rolling averages. So right now we, we are utilizing 2016 to 2020 ACS data. For our next update, we will transition to the 2017-2021 ACS data. EJ Screen is at the highest resolution for which this data is available. So each one of these color-coded polygons that you see on the map here is a census block group. Um, again, this is the most refined unit for which the Census Bureau releases detailed demographics. Um, so this is the highest resolution of, of data that is available, is at the block group level. And that sets EJ Screen apart from a lot of your other tools, like Ben just talked about with this, the EJI, and, and even CGIST is available at the census track level. EJ Screen is available at the block group level. In the name of transparency, everything within EJ Screen, those indicators that I just went through, can all be downloaded. Um, so if you are your own GIS person or work with your own GIS team, you can go on our FTP site and download all the data. Um, that being said, you do not need any special GIS software, any special passwords, um, any, anything besides internet access to access EJ Screen. And we at EPA and our federal state partners you know, and our community stakeholders all use the same exact tool with these same exact data sets. I do wanna take a second here and talk about the unit of analysis that EJ Screen uh, uses. You've heard me talk about block groups and, and Ben talk about census tracts. Um, but it, it, again, it is important to understand the unit of analysis that these tools use. Uh, the census does have a unit of analysis called the block. This is literally you and your neighbors. Um, the census does not release detailed demographics at the block level uh, due to privacy and security concerns. The most refined unit for which the Census Bureau releases detailed demographics is the census block group. Um, a census block group is roughly 1,400 people, uh, but it does vary in terms of population size. They can be as few as 600, upwards of 3,000 people, and certainly varies in terms of geographic size. Uh, so the block group that you're looking at on the visual here is, is, is in a densely populated urban area. This is probably only you know, two-tenths of a square mile, uh, a very refined look at the community within this area. There are census uh, block groups, however, in rural North Dakota, for example, that are 700 square miles. And that is still the most refined unit for which the census uh, releases the data. So again, you just have to take that into account when looking at the data. Some census block groups are very refined, some are much larger. Um, but since we feel, we at EPA feel that EJ issues are inherently local, um, you, we feel that the user should be utilizing the most refined data sets available. And again, that is the census block group. Um, we do also make our data available at the census track level. So we recognize that, you know, the, the EJI, that CGIST, um, Cal Enviro screen, a lot of your other tools that are out there are only available at the census track level. Um, so we also make that EJ screen data available at the census track level. Um, so you can compare apples to apples and things like that. Um, you can also run county level reports in EJ screen. And one of the really nice things about the tool is that you can then compare all the data to state and national averages. Um, real quickly, I'm gonna go through the different environmental indicators that we incorporate into the tool. Um, the first few that we have are, are air related. We have PM 2.5, ozone, diesel PM, air toxics cancer risk, the air toxics respiratory hazard index, 
and then a traffic proximity indicator that we get from DOT. And then to round out the tool, we have a lead paint indicator, a few proximity to EPA re regulated facility indicators, um, an indicator on underground and leaking underground storage tanks, and then last but not least, a wastewater discharge indicator. So again, this is by no means every single environmental burden that could potentially impact a community. These are simply the indicators for which there was national coverage and either block group level data or data which could be relatively easily downweighted to the block group level because some of our uh, air related data sets are available to the census tract, which we then downweight to the block group. Likewise, um, all of our socioeconomic indicators are also available at that block group level. Um, and these are more or less your classic indicators of social vulnerability. You know, communities of color, low income, unemployment, limited English speaking, less in high school education, and then your sensitive uh, populations in terms of age. And again, all the data that is currently featured in EJ screen is coming from the 2016 to 2020 ACS. Um, so while you can get all this information on these uh, individual socioeconomic indicators on their own, EJ Screen also uses those different indicators to formulate two different uh, demographic indices. We have always had our demographic index available in EJ Screen from the inception of the tool. The demographic index is one of the components of the EJ index. I'm going to talk about that, uh, that calculation in a second. But this demographic index is a very simple calculation. It is simply looking at percent low income um, plus percent people of color divided by two. This goes directly back to former President Clinton's executive order on environmental justice, specifically identifying these two segments of the population. Um, so again, our demographic index has always been and will continue to be utilized as one of the components of the EJ indices. New for this last update in October, we did create a new supplemental demographic index. This is looking at five different socioeconomic indicators and rolling them into an average. So we're taking the average of the five of, of these different indicators. Um, we then take that social that supplemental demographic index and combine it in the same exact way we do with our environmental indicators to form these supplemental indices. Um, and again, the supplemental indices and the supplemental demographic index itself are not replacing the demographic index. They are simply living side by side and they offer exactly what it says, a supplemental look or a different look at vulnerable populations. Um, to dive a little bit more into the calculation um, of the EJ indices, and again, the same exact calculation applies to the supplemental indices as well. You're just gonna um, you know, swap out the supplemental demographic index for the demographic index. Um, but we are taking that single environmental indicator in its percentile format, and multiplying that by either the demographic index or the supplemental demographic index. And why do we do this, right? We are doing this in an effort to identify areas that have both higher pollution burdens and vulnerable populations present. Again, the crux of environmental justice. One of the really nice things about EJ screen um, and a similar aspect of, of the EJI is that we are presenting the information in percentile format. So while you can still always get the raw values associated with any of our indicators, you know, putting the indicators and the values into a percentile format, you know, allows for kind of comparability um, and, and that type of analysis. Um, and puts things in perspective for the user. You know, for me, even as a, as a power user of EJ screen, it really doesn't mean much to me if you told me that my PM 2.5 level is 9.4. I don't know if that is good, bad, high, low, in attainment, not in attainment. 
Um, you know, but if you told me that my PM 2.5 level is in the 90th percentile nationally, okay, only 10% of the nation has a higher value than I do. So it puts things in perspective. And that is exactly why we uh, rank all of our results in percentile format. Again, you can still get the raw values, um, but kind of up front and center are these percentile rankings. Um, I, so that is how we, again, present all of our EJ indices, the supplemental indices um, is, is in percentile uh, format. EJ screen does feature a host of other indicators, uh, some in percentile format, uh, if it lends to, to that format, um, some not. Um, but we do have three different health indicators that we have incorporated into the tool. Um, we are, this is thanks to CDC Places in partnership with Robert Wood Johnson. Um, these health indicators are available at the track level. So we do not have block group level data. I do not believe there is block group level data for these uh, health indicators. These are track level data sets uh, for low life expectancy, heart disease, and asthma. Likewise, we have different climate uh, indicators built into the tool. Uh, we have two really nice indicators on wildfire risk and flood risk. Those are coming from a, uh, an MOU we have with the First Street Foundation. And then we also have information on drought, coastal flood hazard, the 100-year flood estimates, and modeled one through six foot sea level rise. And last but certainly not least, um, we do have information on different critical service gaps. Uh, so we offer the user information on food deserts, on medically underserved areas, and on access to broadband internet. Um, depending on your use of the tool, there is a variety of different ways to look at the EJ screen data. Um, if you are looking at a city, a county, a watershed uh, as a whole, right? Probably the maps are a really good place to start, toggle on and off each one of the indicators or indices one at a time and identify hotspots or areas of interest that you then may want to generate a standard report. Um, a standard report is a really nice way to generate three pages of EJ screen information you know, on a specific area of interest. So whether that be a block group, you know, an area around a school or your church, your home, um, that standard report is kind of a, a one-stop shop for all the information that I just went over uh, in EJ screen. Um, you know, you have heard me talk a lot about these, these you know, block groups and census tracts. We, total, we at EPA totally recognize that these are quasi-political boundaries that you know, the community barely recognizes, that pollution burdens certainly don't recognize. Um, so we do allow the user themselves uh, to customize their area of analysis. Um, so you can do things like drop a pin on you know, a facility and put a one mile buffer, a three mile buffer around that pin. You can actually physically draw a, let's say a plume of pollution coming off a site. If you knew where that was, you could actually draw that plume of pollution in EJ screen and generate a report on that. Um, likewise, if you knew there was a discharge coming into a waterway and that discharge affected, let's say one mile downstream, you could you know, trace that one mile downstream segment, put a buffer around that and analyze that. So you're by no means limited to these block group or census tracts assessment. The user themselves can also uh, designate their own area of assessment. Um, and then last, but one of, one of the nicest and newest features that we have available in EJ screen um, are the addition of the threshold maps. Um, so one of the things that sets EJ screen apart from the EJI, which Ben just talked about, is that the EJI is a cumulative scoring tool, right? It wraps those different indicators up into a cumulative score. EJ screen does not do that, right? It is not wrapping anything up into a score. Um, but one of the kind of first steps that we've taken towards examining cumulative impacts is by looking at is by this release of a threshold map widget. 
Um, the threshold map widget allows you to kind of look across those different indicators. So you can set a thir certain threshold, let's say the 80th percentile, for example, and you can look at which one of the 12 different indices, you know, exceed that 80th percentile, if that's what you're looking at. Um, so again, this is by no means wrapping up the different indices into a score, but this is letting the user look across all 12 of those indices at once. Um, so again, we feel that this is a, a very nice step um, towards examining cumulative impacts by kind of providing the user with this cumulative outlook on all the data sets that are in uh, EJ screen. Um, I know that was a lot. There's no way I could I could give you all the information on on EJ screen in 20 minutes. Um, just like you know Ben presented with the EJI, we do have a uh, an EJ screen website that has a ton more information and um, actually a lot of training sessions just like this that are pre-recorded hour long, have a live demo associated with them. Um, so if you're looking for more information, there is a lot of, uh, of data available on our website. We also have been offering office hours. Um, so we have public office hours coming up on the 19th of April. Um, for you know any user to come in and talk about uh, their use of the tool. Um, so I will stop there and see if there's any questions. And then um, I think Ty and I can get into the real nitty gritty during the uh, panel discussion. Thank you so much, Matthew, for your presentation. Um, we'll have some general discussion, time for detailed questions after the break. But I just wanted to see if the committee had any, you know, really brief, just clarifying questions on definitions, that kind of thing. Marcos. Yes, um, hopefully it's a quick question. Um, so I love EJ screen. Let me just say that first of all. And I saw the widget that you have on there. I'm really eager to go, eager to go play with that. Um, so when you're showing the percentiles, that's the main way that you see how a place compares in terms of the level of burden. Does EJ screen include, or have you thought about including uh, indicators when those values exceed like a legal or regulatory threshold or even a, a health defined threshold? Yeah, that's a great question and a great point. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, it is simply looking at the percentile scores, whether that compares to the state averages or the national averages yet. But I do think you're, you're exactly right on is that there should be some sort of corporation incorporation of a, of a health-based threshold or you know, some sort of air quality threshold, whatever it is. And we just haven't gotten there yet. Okay, Ibrahim, did you have a clarifying question? Yes, a very quick question. Uh... Um, Matthew, thank you for the presentation. Um, the medically underserved areas, right? You included a variable about that. Um, is it on um, the census tract level or census block group level? And what's the primary source of the data? Um, I I'm going, I'll pop it in the chat as soon as we're done here. I have to double check. I believe it is census track level data um, that's coming from HHS, but let me, we have it on our website, the exact source, and, and I'll just uh, pop it in the chat for you. Okay, thank you very much, Matthew. No problem. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a break right now. Uh, let's make this a 15 minute break. So let's plan on returning at 25 minutes after the hour. Okay, folks, we are back um, from, our, from our break. I'd like to welcome back uh, Benjamin McKenzie and Sharonda Buchanan from CDC, Tai Lung and Matthew Lee from the EPA and newly welcome Lucas Brown from the CEQ. And what I'm gonna do right now is open the floor for general discussion. And I just wanna lay out some of the uh, expectations and ground rules surrounding this discussion. This discussion is for the benefit of committee members. Uh, the general audience will not participate, but you may provide written comments in Alchemer, and these will be reviewed after this open session. And written comments are always welcome via the project website. And there should be a chat, a link dropped in the chat momentarily. 
So um, I'm just going to open it up now for um, general discussions, questions from the uh, the committee. So please. Lauren. Thanks. I wanted to, mine is a pretty quick question uh, because, uh, but it comes back to Ben, you were talking about the work that the team did to kind of understand which modeled variables had incorporated the same factors in their modeling and then kind of figuring out which were the most impactful variables to include. And I'm curious if there was any um, kind of documentation that accumulated in that process that is shareable. It seems like a really useful exercise that I would hate to undertake again if it was documented in uh, any useful way. Yeah, absolutely. So just for clarification, that, that was specifically referring to the health vulnerability module. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's all of that information, kind of the specifics of, of uh, validation and, and analysis. Those are things that will be made available through our uh, kind of forthcoming methods paper. Um, so they're not currently publicly available. All of the other uh, most most information on kind of the methods and, and everything is, is available through our technical documentation, uh, but not necessarily the, the, the data on statistical analysis. And before I call on a couple more uh, questions here, I just want to introduce also Natasha to Janet and Sharmila Murthia joined us. Say hi. <laughs> okay, uh, Monica. Thank you. So Biden said that this is the year of open data. And I know that NASA and the EPA have been releasing new data sets online. And NASA has some that's for wildfires and um, particulate matter. So I was wondering that if this data is not incorporated into your tools, do you think those open data sets might be useful for consideration in the future? I wasn't sure if they're at census tract level. Um, so I was just wondering if you all think that they might be a, a helpful addition to the tools. Well, I can hop in there um, as we've been in some conversations with NASA about some of their um, satellite data. You know, I, I think that satellite data really has the potential to change the way we look at um, some of our environmental data sets. So we're, you know, we're very excited about um, incorporating some of that data. Um, there are some questions about exactly how um, we use that in addition to some of our on the ground monitoring um, data, uh, especially if they're telling us some different things. So we've been kind of in conversation with some of our different um, air offices about how we could use their NO2 data from, from, the, from NASA in addition to some of our actual um, monitored data. So I think we'll get there. We're probably not going to get there um, in the next couple of months, but I'd say by next year, we'll likely have some of that NASA data in our EJ screen tool. And I'll hop in on, on our side and just say that, yeah, we, we also are, we're very excited by the potential of satellite data. Um, we've been in discussions with NASA's Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team um, kind of talking through um, what what data might might be most applicable or might be available and, and kind of a, a, a provide a better quality than the data currently available at the census tract level. So again, uh, not sure about the time frame for incorporating those data into the EJI, but definitely something that we are we are looking at and excited about. Okay, thank you, uh, Walker. Please, oh, uh, Harvey, can I hop? So I'm sorry. Sorry to cut you off. You want off. to hop in here, Lucas? Please go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm actually uh, already running behind. I'm going to answer one question previous, if you'll uh, forgive me. But um, uh, when you were asking about kind of the data roadmap and uh, indicators we considered um, in the technical support document for the CGIST, that's available on the downloads page of the screening tool, on pages 30 and 31. Uh, we have a list of indicators that we considered for uh, inclusion in the tool and that are not quite there yet. Um, sometimes that's, you know, mostly it's because the data is not available at the census tract level right now. 
Um, but, uh, you know, those are included there because we think the underlying issues are, are fairly important. And if we were able to uh, get data at a narrower resolution that's appropriate for the tool, we'd be excited to explore that. Um, so that might be a little bit of a, a starting point for your consideration. And thanks, Walker, for letting me uh, jump in line in front of you there. <laughs> hey, thanks, Lucas. Walker, please. Yeah, that was that was actually great because it partially uh, answered some of my question. Um, and and also this question is, you know, in some ways rephrasing or reframing um, uh, Lauren and also Monica's uh, questions. So Ben, um, um, it was more of a question of, are you all planning on releasing a sensitivity analysis that looks at uh, uh, indicators correlating with one another, how domains or indicators contribute to that overall EJI score. But it sounds like with your methodology document, you're going to be tackling some of those. Is that right? Exactly. That's that's the plan. Great. And then, um, and then, then also, Ben, this is this is actually great that Lucas hopped in. Similar question for you: Are there indicators? Or, or data sets uh, that you all were thinking about for EJI but could not uh, include uh, for whatever reason at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I think uh, I've looked at the list uh, that CEQ has put together. And it's very it's very similar. You know, you've got some big issues that I think uh, people are very familiar with. Things like drinking water quality, um, agricultural pesticide use. Um, again, things I, I kind of touched on a little bit in in, in, in my presentation that. Um, you know, we're, we're just not finding the data for those indicators. Um, there are a number of other indicators, uh, kind of especially related to environmental burden that uh, that we don't include. So another part of the EJI that I kind of mentioned is that, you know, the model itself is pretty adaptable. Um, it's pretty easy for users with, with, with GIS expertise to download the data, um, add their own indicators if there are local level data available for some of those things. Um, so that's always something that we 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 like to uh, like to mention is that it is adaptable and those data can be added at the local level, but the national level, um, again, those data just aren't there yet. And just following up on what uh, Ben said, you know, about the water quality data, um, many of you may know uh, some of the challenges with water quality data is we know that there have been contaminant violations in water systems but we don't necessarily know the service boundaries of all those systems. So it's hard to put on a map who's drinking that water that we have the contaminant data for. Um, there's a group called the Environmental Policy Innovation Center, EPIC, that's been uh, working to map water service boundaries for the whole country, um, sometimes using uh, explicit known maps that are, that are known to be true and sometimes using a little machine learning inference to model it. Um, there's, you know, other, there's a, there's a lot of interesting academic work going on. Rachel Morello Frosch and others are working on uh, the Toxic Tides project to map um, toxic release inventory sites that are within areas that we expect to uh, experience a lot of coastal flooding um, and other risks in the coming years. So um, certainly there's uh, a lot of internal federal efforts here working on making this data available and then a lot of exciting efforts uh, in academia and nonprofit and the, the private sector. Hey, thanks. Kathleen. Hi. So thanks so much for those presentations. It's super interesting, um, and particularly to compare across these two indices and the CEQ index. And one of the questions that it raises in my mind um, has to do with who's using the indices and how they're using them. Because we heard a lot about um, from CEQ about the fact that their index is intended to, in some sense, determine eligibility for, for investments. And so I think Matthew you used the terminology, a, a designation tool and specifically said that yours is not. And so I guess I'm curious, uh, to understand better how that and the purpose of the tool and who's going to use the tool influences how the tool is structured. So for example, you know, if you have a score, that's quite different from having a, an indicator, you know, in or out, eligible or not eligible. So I wondered if both, both Matthew, you and Ben could talk a little bit of, 
more about who's using your tool, how they're using it, and whether that has influenced how you structure the tool. Absolutely, I can I can uh, hop in on this one. So um, it's definitely something that, that that played into our development of the Environmental Justice Index. Again, like EJ Screen, the EJI isn't intended as a as a um, a labeling tool. It's comparing relative cumulative impacts on health across uh, across census tracts across communities. So it's designed for uh, it's designed for different users. Obviously, the, our focus is on health. We wanted to make a tool that was useful for uh, health professionals or health officials to identify areas experiencing health effects from environmental injustice, and then to uh, respond to uh, respond to environmental factors, social factors. Uh, that, that were contributing to those cumulative impacts. But we've also seen usage by, uh, we've also seen usage by communities who want to take the information from the tool, uh, kind of uh, pr the tool provides a third party validation to what communities already know, which is that they are overburdened by multiple, multiple environmental, uh, environmental burdens. Uh, they face multiple social vulnerabilities and health vulnerabilities. They can take that information uh, and and use it to advocate for themselves. Um, so it's that's definitely also a usage that we see for our tool. Yeah, great answer, Ben. And and just to expand on that for specific to to EJ Screen, I mean, you know, we we built EJ Screen from the beginning with the idea that there, you know, it was designed for a variety of different users and uses. Um, and that just is inherently different than, let's say, the, the CGIS tool, which was designed for a very singular purpose, um, which does, you know, allow itself to be a designation tool. Um, EJ Screen, like, there isn't that singular purpose behind EJ Screen. We see a lot of different users using it in a, a lot of different ways, and that's why you can, you know, you can look at different units of geography. You can look at, you know, different... Um, indicators by themselves combined together with threat and vulnerability. Um, you know, there's just a lot of different ways that you can look at the data in EJ screen. And again, it, it wasn't designed to give you one answer. Um, and that is just a very big difference between uh, that and specifically CGIST. If I can follow up with that, uh, that question, are you tracking how people are using your screening tools or are you planning on? Yeah, we've and Ty, feel free to jump in at any time. But yeah, we've been tracking the the use and and users of EJ Screen almost from the inception of the tool, um, and we are constantly using that feedback that we get to continually make the tool better, to better meet the needs of different users, um, etc. That's a great answer, and I'll I'll say that's uh, EJI is is much newer than EJ Screen. It was uh, only released again back in August of 2022, uh, but we are already tracking, you know, who, who is using our tool for analysis, who's using it for public health interventions, um, and, and looking at community groups that are using it, uh, again, to kind of advocate for themselves. So those are all things that we're trying to keep track of going forward. And I'd love to hop in here as well on the CEQ CGES tool. So um, the, the purpose of this tool, the intended audience, is that um, Executive Order 14008, um, we were charged in CEQ with creating a geospatial mapping tool to help us identify disadvantaged communities, communities that experience disinvestment, marginalization, and potential overexposure to environmental hazards. Um, and we want to do this on the basis of communities that are geographically defined. And so this is part of the Justice 40 initiative and the Justice 40 initiative um, directs our agencies to make sure that 40% of the overall federal invest, the benefits of the federal investments reach these disadvantaged communities. Um, and so I don't want it to sound as if um, it's an in or an out. Um, we want 40% of those investments to reach disadvantaged communities. There is still another 60% of federal investments as well. So I just want to make sure it doesn't sound like an in or an out. Um, but, uh, and then I also want to point you to our 
guidance and instructions. Um, so if you visit the about page of the CGIS website, um, there you will find the recent memo. And, and the memo really specifies directly the audience um, for the CGIS, federal agencies using this um, for those benefit allocation purposes. If I can follow up with that with that answer, Natasha, if you don't mind. Um, so the 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 uh, CGIS tool is a binary tool. It's like identifies a community or doesn't identify, or at least designates a community or doesn't designate a community. Is that is that intended as like a first step screening, or is there any value in um, like an ordinal ranking or a score or anything that goes beyond a binary designation? So we we do want this designation to be the first step. Um, in identifying communities uh, for federal agencies to identify communities that are disadvantaged, but agencies uh, also in the guidance memo receive instruction around um, th that they can further prioritize based on their areas of expertise and based on their um, specific areas of interest. Uh, so but also when you download the information from when you utilize the spreadsheet and the website um, you're able to uh, much more robustly um, qualify and quantify uh, communities disadvantage based on all of those different geographic parameters but when you use the website you will see a yes or no and you'll see which categories um, qualify a community as being disadvantaged Thank you, uh, Jay. Uh, thanks to Ben and Matthew for your excellent presentation. That was really helpful. And I was wondering, uh, when I look at uh, the social vulnerability indicators for EJI or the demographic indicators for EJ screen, and obviously there is a major uh, well, dependence or reliance on census or ACS uh, data, uh, and which kind of uh, makes a focus mainly on residential population or nighttime populations. I was wondering if either of you have thought about, you know, expanding, you know, looking at non-residential uh, populations, uh, daytime risks, uh, using locations of schools and their demographic characteristics, for example. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Great yeah, I, I, I'm happy to, oh, sorry, Harvey. I just said great question. <laughs> That's all, please. Thank you. No, I, I, I'm happy to hop in here because this is actually something uh, I, I'm, I'm very passionate about. Uh, part of our group at, at CDC, um, I mean, part of our, our, our uh, interest is looking at uh, mobility measures and how, how daytime mobility affect uh, exposure and health. Um, it's, it's, it's something that I, I haven't necessarily seen applied, you know, within this kind of cumulative impacts framework where we're which, which is really kind of developed for looking at residential proximity, residential exposure. Um, one thing that we do include within the EJI, however, is a measure within our database is a measure of daytime population, um, which allows which allows users to kind of at least get some kind of idea for uh, where which census tracts are residential or which census tracts are uh, you know places of work. Um, but it's definitely something that we are we are excited about looking into, excited about incorporating into our framework for understanding cumulative impacts, um, because it's such an important part of of, of understanding kind of the uh, the framework of exposure. And I'll hop in here to say, likewise, um, that's one of the areas that we're actually really focused on as well. Um, we have. Um, we are planning to work with an academic on, you know, is there a better way that we can incorporate some uh, data on, on, you know, places of work and obviously schools as well into our calculations rather than just strictly looking at, at the place of residence. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than... <laughs> then I think we have been able to wrap our hands around how we exactly do it thus far. Um, so, you know, I think getting some input from, from academics is going to be pretty important as well. Yeah, I'd like to echo that as well. I think this is a problem that we often run into in epidemiological um, investigations that 
people are not um, in one place all the time. We're we're mobile, we're moving, we're in different places. We may work in a different place. Um, we may visit other places. And if the committee has recommendations around this, uh, we'd be very interested to hear them. Okay, thank you. Ibrahim. Uh, um, so Benjamin, when you, when you say you track how users um, put these uh, tools to use, right? How they apply these tools. How do you get to track them? Um, is it by the products, the publications, or do you reach out to them? Or do you ask them to fill out some forms? I'm just curious. Yeah, absolutely. So um, number one, we, we do try to keep track of publications or um, you know policy uses that we see popping up. Um, and then often we will have people reach out to us directly to our mailbox. Um, again, we, we make our mailbox very prominent for people to ask questions or provide feedback. And we'll get people responding uh, with, uh, you know, saying how they've used the EJI for their own purposes. Um, so those are those are kind of the, some of the, uh, the the routes by which we're tracking tracking EJI use. Thank you very much. I can hop in to say, with DJ Screen, you know, we we do the same. We have like a mailbox um, that tracks all of the all of the feedback that we get on the tool, which is one primary way. But we've also done um, surveys of our EJ Screen, our external EJ Screen users. Um, so we did a survey um, about five years ago, right now, and so it's a little bit dated. We were planning on redoing that survey though, just to get to get a more updated look at who outside of the agency is using EJ screen and what they're using it for. Because I know that in those five years since we've done that survey, it's probably changed pretty significantly. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, Lauren. Um, I have a question, which, I mean, it's, I, I'm curious how much y'all work together or interact with each other when working on building these indices. And I'm curious how you perceive the overlap and the value, you know, like how do you, if I'm a citizen and I'm saying I'm trying, or I'm a, I'm a decision maker and I'm saying I'm trying to figure out this landscape, kind of how do we, how do you justify three tools to evaluate environmental justice and, and how they're different and, and how you kind of work together to make sure that they're meeting different needs. I just want to understand that landscape a little bit better. Right. Can you imagine these tools working in an ensemble to read yeah. some policy or investment decisions? That's a good question. Who wants to go first? It's probably a hard question too. <laughs> I'll, I'll kick us off. I mean, I just think this is, we just are living in a really exciting moment where I think we have access to data. We have access to all of these tools. Um, and I know that we are we are uh, in, in communication. And I think uh, Lucas, Matt, and Ty can speak to the early work that was done. Uh, we, they spent a lot of time with us when we were building the CGEST initially so we could learn from them. Um, we are, you know, I think the reality is, is that there are all of the different users. There are each of the different agencies does have different purposes, different particular targets, but I think our vision is for there to ultimately be um, data overlays, ways that these tools can actually interact. I think NOAA put out the, the climate resilience and mapping application tool that has a nice overlay of CGEST in it. Um, we're seeing examples of this, and I think we're really just at that, that moment um, where we can be really building on what each of the different efforts are focused on achieving. And I'll help in and just say, you know, we have, yeah, we're constantly working with our partners, agencies to try and make sure that we are using the same data and that we're starting from the same place. Um, one of the things we've been talking about is um, setting up some kind of an interagency working group on data and tools to make sure that, um, you know, if we're doing something on climate, that NOAA is telling us, yes, that's a good climate source to use. So we're not all coming from, we're not all doing our own research. We're not all just building in whatever data set makes the most sense. 
that we're all coming from a one federal government point of view. Um, so I think that's that's one of the things that we're really focused on currently with the proliferation of all these different tools. Um, that said, you know, I think a lot of the tools do rely on EJ screen as a as a base starting point and often use EJ, a lot of our data as as some of the primary data sets. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Lucas. Go for it, Ben. Sorry, I was just going to hop in to echo echo Ty and, and, and Natasha's statements that, again, um, you know, I, I think this is a space that we really, really uh, are looking to, to collaborate on and, and work more closely together with everyone across the federal government. Um, but also that, you know, these tools do have different purposes. Um, the EJI is, is specifically designed for uh, evaluating cumulative impacts on health, right? Um, uh, each of these different tools has specific purposes, specific users, and each lends a, a different valuable perspective to, uh, to you know, policymakers, to public health professionals, to communities, um, and they can, they can use these tools in combination uh, to, to address, uh, address environmental injustice. Um, oh, Monica. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lucas. Uh, thanks, RV. Um, I, I definitely endorse everything my uh, my wonderful colleagues said there um, about kind of the different purposes and our coordination. Um, sometimes we have an internal saying that um, a little bit of these EJ screening tools is kind of like a game of Iron Chef. There's like only so many nationally consistent uh, census tract level data sets, and we're all kind of using similar ingredients. For slightly different purposes and we we do stay in coordination of we have different purposes but um we wouldn't you know when we're using the same data we 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 try to use it similarly or express it similarly so that there's not uh confusion on the on the data elements um and i'll continue my my new tradition of being one question behind um in terms of the feedback channels on the CGIS, um we have a pretty active uh, uh, Google Analytics channel uh, monitoring the site. So um, how many people are arriving from where, how long are they spending on different pages, kind of measuring what files are they downloading. Um, we have had about, I believe it's five different uh, methods of feedback on the screening tool over the last year, including our request for information, um, there's a structured survey on the site that you can fill out that's linked from every page about how you're using it, how you might like to see it change. Uh, on every single census tract, people can click a button that sends us feedback on that tract. Um, so if some of that is, is useful, we could, um, we could work to see what might be appropriate to provide um, in terms of our data on how people are using the tool. And thank you so much for clarifying all of that, Lucas. I think that was really important <laughs> for, you, for you to add uh, that response. And, and I just want to build on what you said. There's one other way um, that I wanted to make sure the group is aware of um, that people are providing feedback on the CGES, and that is through email. Um, and I'll share our email. I, I do not have access to the chat, um, so I'm going to just say it. It's screening tool dash support at OMB. Dot EOP dot GOV. Thank you. Hey, Monica, now please. Um, yes, how or do you account for chemical disasters? Because on the one hand, a train derailment can happen in any neighborhood, regardless of economic status. A, an explosion at a chemical facility will not happen in every na neighborhood. But if you are hit with the train derailment, chances are in 30 years, you will be a legacy community with legacy pollution. So if the CGEST is like, you know, if there's a binary, where do we put those communities that are getting chemical disasters because climate change warped the train tracks um, and they really, they don't fit the mold of an environmental justice community, but they may become a super fun site for all we know.
Yeah, I think that's a very important question, um, and, and and one that we've we've actually heard something along these lines, especially considering um, what our friends in Ohio are facing right now. It is fresh on people's mind of you know how can um, all of these types of tools be able to be responsive to um, emerging threats. Uh, um, as you have laid out here. Uh, so the, the question is in the indicators that are that are included in the tool. And um, as your committee makes recommendations um, for further data to be considered, um, data that's around infrastructure that might point to where some challenges are um, or potential challenges could be, uh, would be very beneficial. And some of those show up under our climate and show up under our housing um, burdens right now. And so, uh, recommendations along those lines of data sets that are available that point to infrastructure challenges would be of great benefit. I see people freezing on my screen. I hope that that you were able to hear most of that. We were. And, and I'll build on that to say um, one of the data sets with an EJ screen and, and one of the data sets that um, people use in other tools from EJ Screen is a data set on um, facilities with risk management plans. And those are actually facilities that, you know, a risk management plan is put in place because those facilities have the, the potential to have some issues and, uh, you know, leaks into communities or something like that. So we, we put that in there as a preventative to look at facilities that do have that potential to impact communities in a way that they're not yet, they have not yet done. Do we have that for trains? I'll kind of wrap off. Oh, sorry, uh, Ty, I don't know if you had a, another response, okay. I was just going to wrap off by saying that uh, again, this is it's, it's also something that we've definitely considered. Um, we we do also include in our tool uh, proximity to facilities with risk management plans, the, those facilities that house uh, highly toxic chemicals um, and have some potential for for uh, accidental release. Um, but also, I think uh, you know a very useful thing that the EJI brings to the table is that it's looking at existing vulnerability, um, existing uh, both social and health vulnerability and uh, environmental burden um, to, to you know, allow people to view um, which areas might be the most impacted by, uh, by those, uh, by a, a spill or accident that affects multiple communities. Um, so, so that's just one extra thing that I think our tool brings. Well, thank you. And I, I wanted to clarify as well. I appreciate Ty and Ben bringing up the point of the proximity to risk management plan facilities. We have that included as well. Um, and uh, it's for the um, count of risk management plan facilities that are within five kilometers and for the census tracts that are within the top 10% of that. Um, I, I think that's an important point to add as well. And look forward to recommendations from the committee further around this. Other questions from the committee? Mm. Kathleen. Yeah, just, just a real quick one that um, there's obviously a lot of spatial data, a tremendous amount in all of this. I'm wondering to what extent it um, allows for upstream versus downstream vulnerability, because that can make a big difference. And I don't know whether the kinds of data sources that you're using to capture some of these vulnerabilities can distinguish between that. Can you clarify what you mean by that, Kathleen? Well, for instance, if you're located, I mean, it, what prompts the question is this question about being located near a facility that could potentially say, you know, have a leakage, then it matters whether you're the community that's downstream from that or the community that's upstream from, oh. from that. You mean literally upstream and downstream? Literally, yes. Okay. Or I mean, water-wise, but also air airshed-wise, yeah. So I don't know whether that level of detail is captured in any of these data sets or, or not, perhaps not. Well, <laughs> I guess I can hop in. Um, 
you know, with with the water indicator that we use with an EJ screen, it does actually map um, the pollution as it comes downstream and uses a fate and transport model to show the dispersal of those chemicals throughout the, the water. Um, a lot of our air pollutants don't actually show, you know, downstream versus upstream, but they're showing actual pollution. So, you know, it is showing where the pollution is coming from facilities and impacting communities. So I think our tool does um, address that. And, you know, a lot of the other tools, um, CGES and uh, the EJI use data sets from EJ screen. So they also incorporate those in that way. Um, I think we could always do a better job of doing um, some of that modeling or incorporating some of that modeling into our tool. Um, but we also try to keep the tool more um, accessible to communities. And sometimes if we get too detailed into, you know, modeling of pollution, it can kind of uh, become a little bit harder to understand. So, you know, we let some of our more detailed air and water tools be, you know, the experts at modeling those downstream pollutions. Um, but in any way that we can incorporate um, downstream versus upstream um, pollution modeling, we do do that in our tools. Walker? Oh, I think Eric, did you have a? Oh, you did, sorry, Eric, please. Um, thank you. We've heard the word cumulative uh, several times this afternoon. I was wondering if, if you could each talk about how you define cumulative and how it's reflected in the data and the, your tools as well. Yeah, I can take a, a first stab at that one. Um, so, so again, the way that we are defining cumulative impacts is, is in the context of health. Um, we define it as the overall or as the total harm to human health and well-being of multiple environmental burdens, uh, multiple uh, social and, and, and chronic health factors acting together over time. So um, you know, we're thinking about this in terms of communities that experience multiple different types of pollution, right? They're not just experiencing um high levels of air pollution but they're also experiencing noise pollution that's that's causing stress that's you know potentially making them more vulnerable to air pollution uh we're, we're talking about communities that don't necessarily have the financial resources or or health insurance that uh that, that available to them that helps them to kind of um respond to those uh respond to those uh environmental burdens uh, and, and you know uh pr protect their own health um, that's that's how we think of it, is that model of where do we see multiple different sources of environmental burdens interacting with uh, underlying social and health vulnerabilities. I'll hop in here and say, you know, I, in a lot of ways, we are looking at the same thing as, as Ben. I think his definition would fit a lot of what we're talking about. Um, but I also want to differentiate between like a cumulative score and cumulative impacts, because when you talk about cumulative scores, you really need to have the science dialed in in terms of, you know, how much each of these different pollutants impact the body. Um, we are not quite there yet. Cumulative scores are very difficult to do with with all of these different pollutants. And for that reason, we've kind of steered clear of, of combining all of these different environmental pollutants and saying this is the cumulative burden on, uh, you know, communities from all of these different pollutants. Um, but what we do do is we allow you to look at the cumulative impact. So you can look across the various environmental pollutants and you can see that you know, this pollutant is at the 95th percentile in your community, and this other pollutant is, you know, at the 90th percentile. And so you can see how all of these different pollutants are impacting one community. We're just not there with the science to say, this is how they all impact you and give you one score, um, which is what we're a little bit more um, careful about being an environmental agency. Can I just do a quick follow up there? Thank you for your responses. Um, 
And so I guess there's some differences in whether to aggregate or not aggregate in the, in the these different tools. Um, but Ben brought up this idea of not just multiple, but interacting. And uh, is this something that you, that's been a question as y'all are developing your tools? Um, do you, have you debated including it? Uh, sort of where you are at sort of like interacting, interaction of these, uh, these determinants or burdens or factors? I, I would say that, um, you know, within the EJI, which again is it, it, what the EJI does is it builds on a state a state level framework for understanding um, cumulative impacts on health, which which again uh, uses it, it doesn't apply specific weights or specific um, kind of importance to individual indicators, um, but but rather acknowledges them kind of all acting equally together on health over time, um, which we know is you know not going to be entirely accurate, um, but it does provide that kind of high level screening overview of where communities face multiple environmental burdens and multiple social vulnerabilities. Um, I think that, again, that's very important to recognize is that it is a screening level tool um, in that regard. Um, we do we do try to acknowledge, you know, within within our uh, documentation, within everything that we do, where we where we see literature showing interactions between uh, individual indicators. Um, and, and, and make sure that people understand that. So if you go into the EJI um, and you're looking at an individual community uh, in our mapping tool, uh, you can click on you know, a, a particular indicator and it will take you to a page that lays out both, you know, kind of the data set behind each individual indicator and kind of um, an overview of the literature on how that indicator might contribute to, uh, might contribute to cumulative impacts on health what kinds of factors it might be interacting with. Um, that's kind of the approach uh, that we've taken and, and where we're at right now. I just wanted to squeeze in if there's a moment to do so. Um, Eric, uh, we very much uh, appreciate the question that you've raised because you know this is essentially um, exactly what we're looking to interact with this community, um, with this committee around is, is understanding um, uh, cumulative impacts and um, understanding their application in the tool, um, the methodology, but also um, different factors of, of a cumulative impacts, whether ranking um, is a recommendation. Uh, so we're, we're very interested to, to hear from the committee um, recommendations when it comes to cumulative impacts and CGIS. Thank you. Can I just follow up? What do you mean by ranking there? Are you talking about ranking the communities or ranking the impacts or can you? Well, um, give it, give us explain that a little bit. Uh, sure, and and we're not we're not um, pushing for any specific way of doing it, but we're interested in the whole of recommendations and whether or not that recommendation would include ranking. Um, and so it, it could be um, the ranking of the impacts um, among communities. So, but I, I don't want it, I don't want that to sound prescriptive. It was just right. an example. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, Walker. Thanks. So through the development of these of these tools, you know, I think there are a number of ways um, where the developers of these tools and people working on these can can get feedback or collect information on how to advance the tool, how to how to improve the tool over time, internal ways and external ways, both consulting with you know experts among your agency. Um, I think somebody mentioned office hours. Uh, having formalized training programs. Somebody else mentioned email earlier on. I'd just like to hear if y'all have anything to share regarding your respective tools. Are there particular methods of feedback or collecting information that really were really particularly valuable for you and, and really stuck out to you as a good way to get information that helped to advance indicators or methodologies? If, if I, I can I, add on, oh, sorry, go. If I can add on to that question, I, I also would like to know how you kind of balance this, you know, the feedback from users with 
the grounding of these indicators in the literature and theory, because I know Ben in particular talked a lot about that, about looking at the literature and what, what in, in, in the indicator construction. How, how are you balancing those two? Yeah, I think those are those are both very good questions. From from EJ Screen's standpoint, I think the the most beneficial avenues that we're getting feedback from actual users are during the training sessions themselves. Um, we do a ton of tailored EJ Screen trainings, so we tailor the the training to the audience, right? And that's where we're getting the kind of the most bang for our buck in terms of feedback from those particular users. Um, is during those those training sessions, and then we can take the, that information back, digest it as you know as a team, um, and determine what gets what gets incorporated in. Because as you mentioned, Harvey, like some of this stuff is is straight up wish list items that that we're hearing that isn't in reality is not going to be incorporated into the tool. It would be awesome, right? But we don't live in in that reality. Um, so you know there there's the training sessions um the email inbox i don't think we could you know that is that is huge we do get uh probably hundreds of of hits a year on on suggestions from the email inbox um and then within the last six months we have opened up those office hours uh to the public we also hold internal epa office hours but i think in terms of getting information um from the public um, how they are actually utilizing the tool and what aspects of the tool they that we could enhance to benefit their use. I think those have been invaluable, uh, those those office hours. I would absolutely agree. Um, you know, we, we, we also present on EJI among communities across the United States. Um, we, we do we do presentations, webinars, um, answer questions. And, and often it is um, you know, when we're interacting, I, I think interacting with uh, individual communities uh, where we get some really useful perspective on uh, on uh, indicators of concern in those communities. Again, they're not always indicators that we're going to be able to address. Um, there are a lot of restrictions in the data uh, for, for, for doing something at a federal level, um, but at least they're things that we can look into addressing. Um, but we also get lots of great feedback through our through our email um, and through uh, conversations with other federal partners and academic partners, um, all of which we, we kind of are, are taking into consideration as we think about our next iteration of the tool. Um, and it's definitely something uh, like Harvey, you mentioned, it's, we're going to we're going to be having to work to balance um, what we're hearing from communities, from from users with uh, with you know, best practices from the literature um, and, and kind of making those decisions as, uh, as, as we can. But something, you know, we, we want to emphasize with the EJI is that we want it to be something that is founded uh, founded in the best science available. So we, we, we are definitely um, making sure that we are uh, incorporating the best practices from the literature. And I see also um, my colleague, Dr. Dr. Shrenda Buchanan from uh, the National Center for Environmental Health and, and HHS Office of Environmental Justice has joined. Uh, Dr. Buchanan, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you uh, for, for having us today. Uh, I, I just want to just quickly introduce myself. I actually head up an Office of Environmental Justice at CDC, but I'm also serving simultaneously as the director or interim director of HHS's new Office of Environmental Justice. And so that coordination is, is very closely tied and linked um, the Assistant Secretary here at HHS, uh, Assistant Secretary Rachel Levine, has been doing a series of community engagement all across the, the country, and uh, we've had the, uh, the, the fortune to be able to actually present the EJI and many of those uh, community engagements. There's lots of good feedback that comes from that, just hearing the questions and the comments and all of what's coming from community members themselves, because we want them to be able to utilize that. Um, when we start to focus in on, um, again, one of the issues that we're concerned about here today in terms of cumulative impacts, they they really feel that that is um, moving them a little bit toward and forward in being able to justify um, uh, environmental injustices and, and solutions to those injustices. So again, that's been very, very helpful. As Ben is saying, we're not able to incorporate 
all the feedback, but it's been very, very beneficial to engaging communities and hearing from them what, what they would like the tool to, to look like and how they might utilize it. And in some of those community engagements, we're talking about academicians, we're talking about just um, um, community organizations, uh, environmental justice community-based organizations, and all of that feedback has been really, really good. The uh, EJ coordinators box, which I'm, I'm assuming Ben has alerted you guys about, uh, we, we, we monitor that daily. Lots of good feedback comes to that as well. Again, our EJI was just released this past August and the tremendous outpouring of, of feedback and thoughts and uh, I mean, uh, very, very, very much from the community has really, really helped us to kind of think about what can we incorporate as we think about the next iteration of environmental justice index. So. Again, thank you for, for having me. And, and I'll hop in after Dr. Buchanan. Um, certainly uh, there's a, a lot that takes place uh, to improve the tool over time. And, and this is built in uh, to our instructions on this tool actually, that by the start of each federal fiscal year, there is to be an update to the CGEST. Um, and to do so, we work to listen to communities. We um, work to hear from the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. We have requests for information um, that are out. Um, in, in addition, we hear from federal agencies, our federal partners on this. Um, we get lots of feedback via email. We have our office hours as, as we just had office hours for federal agencies today. Um, and then there are surveys that are available and survey tools that exist through the CGEST as well that people are able to provide that type of feedback. Um, so we, we really want to hear from all the communities and all the users um, so that we are able to continuously update CGEST meaningfully. Do you have a sense of how many users you have of these different tools? I, I can hop in from the EJI side. Um, we I, like like uh, I, I think uh, Lucas mentioned with uh, with CGEST, we do have kind of user analytics that track you know how often each page is being visited. Um, kind of the pathways that people take through our website, um, but that doesn't kind of translate down into number of unique users. Um, so, you know, we, we have some kind of idea of how many times uh, the, the website has been accessed, but not of uh, individuals using the tool. Uh, just give us a second to log into our Google Analytics and I'll get you the... Okay. <laughs> It'll keep me one question behind. It'll be great. <laughs> we can, yeah, we have the same ability in terms of Google Analytics to tell you the number of hits that we get on a page. Um, but, but I would say definitely likewise to Ben's response, that doesn't necessarily tell us how many people are actually using the tool. There's so many different ways that people are using the tool. Um, and many of, some of those are tracked, some of those are not. So we don't really it's hard to have a really good answer on that one, I would say. Okay, Ibrahim, you've been very patient. Thank you, Hazi. Um, so I have a question for um, Natasha regarding the C just tool and um, about the, the ranking um, for disadvantaged communities. So as it is now, um, the tool, especially the map interface is actually binary, but it's either whether it's disadvantaged or the community is not disadvantaged. You pull the, the spreadsheet and take a look at the variables. Yes, you could actually, on the surface value, be able to compare and gauge and rank, but it's actually difficult when you are dealing with about 20 variables. So um, thinking about this, um, Natasha, would you recommend or would you suggest, and I just would appreciate if you could share your thoughts about this, having a variable, a single variable that could actually um, provide an insight into the aggregate measure or kind of a, a composite measure, all the variables combined. That, that way we could actually compare between census tracts, for example. Um, and also having another variable um, that would reflect what we see on the map on whether or not uh, a community is actually disadvantaged. This is on the spreadsheet. Um, so 
So that's my first question. My second question is regarding the mental health uh, component. Um, so the, the that domain, we don't have that variable included under the health uh, the domain for CGEST. And I'm wondering um, whether you could explain the rationale behind excluding mental health. Thank you. Let me lower my hand. I, I can quickly um, go and back to the user's question. Uh, the numbers are, um, we've had about 26,000 users from the launch of the 1.0 uh, this past fall until um, last month, uh, mid-January when uh, we, we stopped measuring, well, you know, the, the particular metric that I'm counting from, from the launch. Uh, it was about 51,000 page views, 90% new visitors staying for um, about a minute and a half on average. But I would say also just that the fact that we have a spreadsheet and that's actually where a lot of our federal agencies will be using and manipulating the spreadsheet. So that's actually not being counted, captured in the, those kind of unique views. And, and I think that builds nicely to your question on ranking. So what we have is a as a thresholds approach um, or cutoffs um, at above a certain um, percentile of X exposure, um, then this community is considered um, to in fact um, have this burden of this indicator. And if that is in addition to one of the socioeconomic indicators respectively, then that community um, would be identified as disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're asking is about ranking. Um, and so through the spreadsheet, as you pointed out, one may be able to rank, but if you're using the online interface of the CGES, you will have a binary yes or no, this community is disadvantaged or not disadvantaged. Um, and we once again welcome recommendations that the committee may um, may recommend for further being able to um, uh, enhance ability to identify disadvantaged communities. And what about the role of um, data uncertainty in affecting that those those rankings or decisions? Is that something you you have considered? I guess this would be for all 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 three groups. Like we know, for example, that census data can have margins of error, especially in, in more remote, rural and remote areas. And yet we're getting a crisp answer, either a score or a ranking or a binary designation. And I, my question was almost the exact same as that. Okay. Um, sometimes communities and we have like local data, like through Smell My City, that show that the TRI data does not reflect what's really happening um, in terms of emissions. So how do you account? Or like, I was gonna also mention the census, you know, people may be afraid to take the census. Um, how do you account or are you concerned that you may miss some communities because the data is wrong? And if data, if communities have local data and they send it to you, what would happen? I, I can start to answer that question. I think again, it's 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 a very very good question and, and something that um, uh, people in this field think about a lot. Um, we don't necessarily include uh, measurements of uh, measurements of error within our calculations. Our calculations are based on estimates which do have um, some level of error. At, at least the the census ones have some level of error associated with them. Um, one approach to, to, to that is just making, uh, making the measurements of error uh, available within the database so that users can understand areas where they have or where high levels of error exist. Um, aggregating up to census tract level also, uh, you know, that, 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 that's providing a little bit less error, having that slightly higher level of aggregation, there's a little bit less error associated with each estimate. Um, uh, also, um, you know, one thing that we stress within our documentation is that small levels of difference between, say, two census tracts 
shouldn't necessarily translate to say to, to, to saying that one is is has is experiencing higher cumulative impacts than another. It's it's better to more informative to look at areas with large differences. Um, just because again, they there are errors associated with all of those data. Um in terms, I, I'll also mention that um, this is something that you know our, our group at CDC has been working on for a while: is evaluating sensitivity of tools like the Social Vulnerability Index to uh, to census error. So, um, hopefully, something that you know we can we can start to address in, in future a bit more. Um, in terms of answering Monica's question about local level data that's provided to us. Um, you know, again, we're trying to use nationally consistent data sets, um, which does mean that, you know, if there's data available for a, an individual community or state, that's not necessarily something that we have the capacity to integrate into our overall national level, national level uh, uh, assessment. That said, um, that said, again, we, we've designed the EJI to be something that is easily adaptable to the lo to local needs and circumstances. Our model is specifically designed so that uh, people can take uh, state or state or local level data, uh, add it into the model, recalculate, and come up with their own uh, own calculations that do incorporate those those local data. Um, so that's that's a functionality that you know again it, it requires a, a somewhat advanced user, um, but they are able to do that. Um, so that, I, I think that's that, that's my answer. Thank you. And, and in, thanks, Ben. I think that was a great answer. And in terms of integrating local data or even any other uh, data sets into EJ Screen, while you know while we are limited to those national level, you know, national coverage data sets for our our data indicators that are incorporated into the methodology, right? The user themselves can always add in their own data. Um, so if the user has a shape file, for example, you can add that as a layer directly into EJ screen. Um, you can add that from your PC, you can add that from a map service from a different tool, or you can add that from the geo platform, which the geo platform is kind of like an online library in the sky. Um, and you can bring those data sets, you know, those more localized or any other data sets directly into EJ screen. It's not going to adjust the methodology, right? It's not gonna be incorporated into the calculations, but you can at least start viewing it as, as an overlay, um, which is really nice for a lot of the community groups that might not have their own GIS system, right? They can utilize EJ screen and just layer, you know, layer on their own data. Um, so I think in back to the this question, I think um, at C with, when developing the CGES tool, we thought a lot about the challenges with the data. And we tried in between the beta and version 1.0, we tried to make a couple of changes to try to adjust, address um, the concerns that were raised. So for example, um, we do now impute income where that's missing in line with best statistical practices. Uh, part of the decision to include the lands of federally recognized tribes was both in response to public feedback that we received uh, recommendations from our partners at the Department of the Interior, but also recognizing that that data, we did tribal consultations and we heard from tribal leaders who said, this data is not particular, does not represent what we're seeing on the ground. Um, the question about data and its really its accuracy at the local level just reminds me of the conversation we had last week and a question about whether or not there might be, you know, there might be data sets that are available at the local level or in certain geographies. And I think one of the challenges that we all face is that we are trying to rely on nationally consistent publicly available data sets. And if this committee has a methodologically sound way of recommending a way in which you could actually be stitching together some kind of data set using, um, you know, it, in a way that would actually address these concerns, I think we are interested in hearing those ideas, whether or not we could incorporate them is, is yet another question. But I mean, you have the ability to sort of think outside the box in that way. Um, and we are really just relying on the, you know, the, the, the tools are as good as the data. And I think we all recognize that the data needs to be better. And in particular, for example, in the U.S. territories, um, we know we need better data sets. Uh, but we're not in the, you know, we're we're talking to folks trying to put those those streams in place. But right now, the tool reflects what we have available publicly. And I, 
100% agree with everything that Charmilla just said. That is, you know, it, the tools really are dependent on, on the data. One thing that we do with EJ screen is that we are very clear about EJ screen being that, you know, it is a screening tool. And a lot of times, if you get down to that um, local level, you can find better data. Um, so, you know, we always view it as a starting point, um, but always say, you know, any of the results from EJ screen should be verified on the ground when possible. Um, because there is always going to be better data out there, especially at like the local level. I'll just add to that by saying, uh, again, I totally agree with Ty and Charmilla that um, I, I think it's something that I always like to emphasize with EJI is that it's it's not designed as a silver bullet, right? Um, it's not designed to be the be all end all. It's designed to start conversations and not to end them. And it is always important to supplement to supplement that, you know, these kinds of national level data with local local understanding, community input, um, uh, and and just kind of you know making sure that um, you you are you're looking at at uh, conditions on the ground and the lived experience of the people in those communities, and not just at the data. Um, also, just want to emphasize again that you know these these kinds of data aren't uh, they're they're not designed as a uh, as a replacement for something like a health risk assessment or uh, a, a um, exposure assessment that, that's you know really designed to get at those more detailed questions of how factors interact uh, to, to influence health. It's a high these are high level screening tools, especially EJI. It's a high level screening tool um, that that again provides an entry point to understanding those relative conditions of overall cumulative impacts on health. Hey, thanks, uh, Eric. So looks like many of these tools, if not all of them, you, in their demographic information, use a measure of income. And I'm wondering to what extent there's concern about like local variation in cost of living and therefore like varying definition, you know, definitions of what low income actually means. And the, their implications for national comparisons, because this is all relative, right? Right, low income means something different in California versus Ohio. I, is I, that what you're talking about, Eric? Yes. I, I, I can start, because I think that's something that we, we were definitely thinking about in the creation of our tool. Um, which is one reason that, you know, along with just an indicator of um, overall poverty, you know, percentage of population living under uh, twice the federal poverty level, um, we also included an indicator measuring uh, uh, a percent of residents who uh, making under $75,000 a year who also uh, experience extreme housing burden, right? Um, that's starting to get some of those answers of, or some of those questions around cost of living. We're looking at where um, lower income communities also experience very, very high levels of, of uh, uh, payment for, for housing costs. Um, so that's that's a, a, a start to addressing that within our tool. Others? So in, in the CGIS, the, the socioeconomic threshold uh, that is primarily used throughout is based on 200% of the federal poverty line. So it is a, a fixed number. Um, we do have area median income, um, which is adjusted to either the income of the metropolitan area you're in, or if you're in a non-metropolitan area, rural area, adjusted to the median income of the state um, as one of the indicators as well. So um, there, there is some flexibility there. And likewise, we're, we're using twice the federal poverty level as well. We're not looking at, at fluctuations yet, um, you know, local or even state level fluctuations, but I think that's a, an excellent point. And, you know, again, even with like the health data, this is providing you that foundational level view of then you can always build on, you know, more local and better uh, data if it's available. Okay, Lauren. Um, one thing that has come up 
uh, that came up. I think, I think EJI includes mental health. I think EJ screen didn't include mental health. If I was just, I mean, I was looking pretty quickly. Um, and I, I know that justice 40 doesn't, I'm curious kind of what the, just wanted to get a sense of when you were thinking about including a measure of mental health versus not what the um, kind of thought process was there. I guess I'll start off. Um, you know, with us, we have just recently included for the first time some of our health indicators. And for our first cut, you know, we took a look at some of the some of the indicators that could be more health related. Um, and so we chose ones, you know, uh, based on um, based on that, heart disease, um, obesity. But we, you know, it's not the end all be all. We're hoping to expand some of our environmental indicator or our health indicators in coming years. Um, we're also relying on the data from um, CDC. So, you know, we're, we're looking at what, that places data from the CDC rather. Um, so we're looking at just those indicators that have that higher resolution of data. Um, but that said, you know, we're we're likely going to be expanding on those data sets, and in, mental health would be one of the ones that we're definitely considering. It just didn't make our first cut. <laughs> Okay, Walker. Yeah, just regarding a specific indicator uh, for the for the EJ screen folks, it looked like low life expectancy was included in the supplemental demographic index. I think I saw on that slide, but then I think I also saw it as a health indicator. Um, could you just talk a little bit about that? It, it looked, I don't know, I don't think out of place is the right term, but the low life expectancy was a, was sort of grouped together with some of these other socioeconomic indicators. Maybe y'all could just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so so low life expectancy is one of the five indicators that is incorporated into our supplemental uh, demographic index. Um, and it is, you know, it is one of those, like it, that's a health related indicator, right? That is incorporated with, with uh, other demographic index in, indicators um but we think we thought it made sense to to kind of group those together for the for the supplemental um demographic index um that being said the low life expectancy is incorporated in our our health indicators uh in the category uh if you go into uh the tool and you know i'd say that we felt that low life expectancy is kind of one of the most powerful um, indicators that kind of tell a story of what a community is, um, how a community is impacted. Um, so, you know, although it wasn't one of the other ACS data sets, uh, we felt it was important enough to bring it in. Hey, we're just about ready to start wrapping up this session. Uh, any last questions from the committee? Okay, hearing none, I think we'll start to wrap things up. Um, I just want to thank everyone for their comments and the, and the responses from um, the, the three agencies here and the CEQ, two agencies and CEQ. Um, I want to remind everyone that any conclusions or recommendations made by individuals during this event should be considered opinions of those individuals and should not be considered conclusions or recommendations issued by the committee or the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I also want to remind the audience that the committee welcomes written input at any time through the project website, which is found in chat. And I also want to remind the uh, committee to reassemble for a closed session at 4 p.m. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you uh, for the discussion. And um, we appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you all being patient while we played with schedules and made these meetings happen at all. So, <laughs> and Everyone's I'm sure you. Busy. 
I'm sure you all will be hearing from the committee soon. So thank you to our guests. Bye-bye. <laughs>